Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Elizabeth Ranieris, and I'm the founding director of the Notre Dame IBM Technology Ethics Lab, along with my colleague Mark McKenna, the director of the Notre Dame Technology Ethics Center. I'm very happy to welcome you to the sixth and penultimate talk in our spring speaker series. This series is focused on the role of technology in promoting mis- and disinformation, the ethical problems involved, and the technical, legal, and institutional responses best suited to our modern challenges. We've been joined by a world-class group of experts from academics to practitioners and activists facing these challenges from a variety of different perspectives, and today is no exception. So far, we've examined the role of scale, accountability, values, interdisciplinarity, and more in the context of online mis- and disinformation. And today, we'll explore the role of online anonymity, identity, and privacy in promoting or fighting mis- and disinformation on the platforms and how to build a healthier and more inclusive online information ecosystem. We are fortunate to be joined by two distinguished guests with quite divergent backgrounds and perspectives on these topics. First up, we have Jillian C. York. Jillian is a writer and activist whose work examines the impact of technology on our societal and cultural values. Based in Berlin, she's the Director for International Freedom of Expression at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and previously worked at Harvard's Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society. Jillian is a fellow at the Center for Internet and Human Rights in Berlin and a founding member of the Deep Lab Coll Collective. She serves on the IFEX Council, the Open Tech, Open Tech Fund Advisory Council, and the Advisory Board of SNEX. Her new hot off the press book, Silicon Values, The Future of Free Speech Under Surveillance Capitalism, explores how our rights have become increasingly undermined by major corporations that harvest our personal data and turn it into profit as well as how governments have used the same technology to monitor citizens threatening our ability to communicate. We are also joined by David Magerman. David is a philanthropist, as well as a co-founder and managing partner at Differential Ventures. Previously, he spent his career at Renaissance Technologies, widely recognized as the world's most successful quantitative hedge fund management company. At Renaissance, he helped found its equities trading group and played a lead role in designing and building trading simulation and estimation software. He is now using his data science, software development, and statistical modeling expertise to help startups succeed. David holds a PhD in computer science from Stanford, as well as a Bachelor of Arts in Mathematics and a Bachelor of Science in Computer Sciences and Information from the University of Pennsylvania. Jillian and David, thank you so much for being here today. So I'll lead us in a discussion for about 30 minutes, after which we'll take some questions that have been submitted by the audience. And for those tuning in live, there's a link to submit questions in the live stream as well. So without further ado, let's get started. Today's session is entitled The Ethics of Verification, Identity, and Anonymity on the Internet. The idea was in part inspired by events over the last six months, from the banning of public figures like Donald Trump from social media to the identification of January 6th Capitol insurrectionists on the basis of social media posts. So let's start with some background with each of you. I'd like to ask how you got interested in this topic of online and an identity and anonymity. And Jillian, perhaps we'll start with you. So when did you first hone in on questions of identity and anonymity online? Uh, sure, yeah, thank you for having me. Um, and this is a great question. Around 2010, um, I started to look at uh, the ways in which Facebook and other social media companies were basically, you know, guiding what we could say, how we could express ourselves. And one of the first stories, um, the first people who came to me was a woman with a, not a particularly peculiar name, but she happened to have a Muslim first name and a Jewish last name. And she kept getting kicked off Facebook and asked for her identification to prove her real identity. Um, and that's when I became aware of Facebook's so-called real names policy. Now I think it's called the authentic identity policy. Um, and and really kind of started to understand the ways in which policies like that one affect people from various backgrounds. Um, over the years, I've you know, talked to a lot of different people from whether we're talking about LGBTQ youth or domestic violence victims, um, and really have just tried to understand why anonymity is so important for people who are at risk in our societies. Thanks, Jillian. David, how about yourself? How did you first get interested in this topic? So, yeah, so I, I, first of all, thanks for having me. I really appreciate being here and honored to be uh, talking about these issues. Um, I actually started out as a computer scientist, my background showed, um, and I worked in early data science approaches to AI and natural language processing. And um, when that turned out to be too early, the computers really weren't fast enough for the um, ideas I had and, and there really wasn't any data uh, to work with uh, back in the 80s and 90s. 
um, I switched to quantitative finance and really was very heads down for my entire career. Um, in the uh, preamble to the 2016 election, I learned, um, I was kind of shocked to find out that the CEO of my company was very heavily engaged in political activism, secretly behind the scenes without anyone knowing he was really involved. And one of the things that um, he was doing was funding um, Cambridge Analytica and Breitbart News um, and having an outsized influence on the tenor um, of conversation and you know uh, the uh, volume of misinformation going on in, in the lead up to the campaign. And um, I, I didn't do anything about it. And I was kind of um, you know embarrassed and uh, deflated that I didn't take any steps before the election. Uh, and when the election happened, I decided to, um, to become active and learn more about the issue. Um, and what I found was people didn't really understand um, how their data was being used and how information that they put online was being both monetized and also being used to manipulate them. And so I got involved with a campaign called Freedom, Freedom from Facebook uh, to just educate the public about uh, the impact of companies like Facebook um, and Google and other technology companies and to show people how their data was being used. Um, and really from there, uh, got more deeply involved in understanding the nuances of the issues on, on both sides and really uh, understanding I didn't know enough uh, to uh, make terribly bold pronouncements and uh, spent the last couple of years learning more. Thanks, David. Um, since you mentioned the Freedom from Facebook campaign, which I believe is now Freedom from Facebook and Google <laughs> campaign, um, can you explain why you provided initial support and how you think about the dominance of these two companies in shaping our online experience? Sure. So I was really anxious to get people aware of the issues. Um, I, I frankly, as an early data scientist and someone who promoted the use of, of human behavioral data and, and, and language data to, um, uh, to, to uh, do AI analysis, to do uh, uh, machine processing of information, um, I thought it was you know, incumbent on me to try to help solve the problem I kind of in a small way helped create. Um, so um, I approached a marketing group about how we could just inform the public. And I basically gave them free reign to design a campaign to share with the public the problems that platforms like Facebook and Google um, and really Amazon and lots of other platforms that have lots of data that they're using uh, and monetizing. And they came up with Freedom of Facebook, um, which really was kind of their creation. I funded it and gave them kind of like the seed idea of how to go about it, but it was really their idea to focus it on Facebook, folks focusing it on breaking up Facebook and eventually expanding it to a, a broader group of, uh, of supporters and also a, a broader uh, group of targets for their activism. So I think that'll spark really interesting conversation, particularly in relation to Jillian's new book. Um, I wanna hold off on that for just a second. Um, Jillian, so you work on international freedom of expression at the EFF. Um, in your experience, what is the role of anonymity in promoting freedom of expression online? And how does that vary around the world and in different communities? Yeah, it's a great question as well. Um, Oh, sorry, I thought I was muted there. Looking historically, I mean, many of the movements that we now think of and accept today really just wouldn't have existed without the right to anonymity or at least the right to private conversation. So when we think about scientific development, when we think about LGBT rights, uh, women's rights, all of these things, um, the progress, even the civil rights movement, the progress that we've seen happened because people were able to talk in ways that they felt safe and anonymity is an enabler of that. Of course, anonymity has also, um, you know, protected some some of our greatest philosophers and authors throughout history, or pseudonymity, so to speak. Um, and so, looking around the world, I mean, you know, there are plenty of people who are bold, who are unafraid, who go out using their real names, and I've got the utmost respect for them. But even if we look at just the past decade and a half, let's say, of social movements, um, movements of justice and democracy, there are always people who are working more behind the scenes, people who are using the cover of, of anonymity or pseudonymity to do some of the really important groundwork. Um, you know, there's a lot of these people that we don't know throughout history who play huge roles in our movements. Um, we see the figureheads, but we don't see um, the other folks. And so when I, you know, I do a lot of work in the Middle East and North Africa, um, and, you know, I, I was involved in... <laughs> interesting ways, you can see it in the book, um, in the, the uprisings in Egypt and Tunisia specifically. And there, of course, you know, you did have people who put their lives on the line and often ended up in prison because of it. But you also had many people who were sharing information um, and doing so online using 
you know, not their real names or not their birth names. And I think that that's a really important facet that we have to think about um, when we think about moving forward as a society. David, I want to give you a chance to respond. Um, from your perspective, what do you think the role of anonymity has been, particularly in light of things like mis and disinformation, which is the subject of our spring speaker series? Yeah, so J Jillian, I, I love the way you, you uh, posed, uh, posed the, the issue, which is about the difference between private, private speech, which is really important, and public discourse. And I think that there is an important role that anonymity plays, um, and not so much anonymity that like the idea that you don't have to say who you are, but the idea that conversations should be allowed to happen without oversight. And the fact that we're doing a lot of things online, especially now, unfortunately, with COVID, this, these conversations are happening um, on Zoom and on, on other kinds of uh, media like this, that the idea that our, not only our identities, but the content of our conversations is being recorded and tracked and monitored is really problematic. At, at the same time, there are things be before the internet where you know, publications, uh, articles, um, public speech, legal transactions, uh, financial transactions, those are all things where identity was required. And I think that we've, you know, got, we're, we're bucketing the whole problem into anonymity or non-anonymity. I think that there is a room for both tracks that I think there are, are parts of the conversation where we need to have, especially in, in, the, in, the, in the area of dispersing information, you know, uh, information about COVID vaccines, about, about the COVID disease, about political activity. There are conversations that are happening that have international importance and lives are at stake and the idea that those conversations can be had not only with unidentified characters of you know, unknown intention, but also bots and uh, other kind of automated communication devices, which are going to skew the conversation. I think the scale and rate of disinformation is amplified exponentially by the lack of accountability in public discourse. So I think that, that you know, if we take the anonymity issue and break it up into two pieces, we definitely deserve the right to anonymous communication privately. But I think there are certain, for the sake of social contracts, I think where conversation and speech has an impact on society, um, I think we have an obligation to identify ourselves and to identify our backgrounds and motivations. And in fact, that was my one issue with, with uh, my boss who was influencing the election. I had no problem with him advocating for the things he wanted. My problem was that he wasn't identifying himself and making clear all the efforts he was making, why he was making them, what his political motivations were. And I think that's an important piece of the puzzle. And I want to touch on the point about privacy, but I feel like Jillian wants to jump in here. <laughs> so please do so. Yeah, no, David, these are really excellent points. And honestly, I'm, I, I'm just going to take off my EFF hat and be very frank. I'm of two minds here because on the one hand, you know, I do see your point completely. And I think that in a democratic society, that makes sense. I think that for people who are living under more authoritarian governments, that's a really problematic point of view in the sense that, you know, we, we can't protect people from government. And so these, to me, these are ideal world kind of solutions. Although in an ideal world, I would, I would certainly agree with them. But I think the other thing is that we don't really have the evidence to back up the idea that using one's real name or using one's um, authentic identity, whatever you want to call it, promotes civility, um, promotes, you know, I mean, accountability. Um, as a woman on the internet, some of the very worst harassment that I've gotten over the past few years is from Mike Cernovich. Um, he's come after me several times and his name is Mike Cernovich. Um, and he's proudly, you know, verified on Twitter when he's harassing me. And so, you know, I think when it comes to that, um, I'm just not convinced by that argument, although I see your point. And then lastly, just, you know, I think the transactional, uh, sorry, financial transaction point is also a really strong one. Um, I'm, again, personally, not speaking for EFF, I'm quite torn on cryptocurrency. Um, but at the same time, you know, some of the most important and valuable uses of things like that that I've seen, again, have come from countries um, such as Morocco, where I used to live, where it's illegal to export the currency. And so people are basically pushed into poverty um, by under a rich monarchy because of the fact that they can't use their own money uh, abroad. And so I think that, you know, we have to consider these societies as well when it comes to these ideas. Yeah, Jillian, I, I'm glad you brought up evidence. So um, I know you've done a lot of work to catalog <laughs> some of the research around things like, you know, real name or user identi identity verification policies um, and proposals. Um, could you point us to some of the more compelling research uh, that demonstrates some of the flaws and dangers or, you know, even some of the real world examples such as Twitter or Google's verification programs and how those have panned out? 
Sure. Yeah. So when, you know, when it comes to um, the verification programs that companies put forward, um, I think really the problem there is not that these these ideas wouldn't work. It's that the companies don't put enough investment behind them. And so, you know, for example, with Facebook, a lot of times people get prompted into an endless automated ID cycle. And I'm sure, David, that we would agree that that's not the ideal form of how these things should work. Um, but in terms of the research, there's some really, really great research. I've got a blog post up. I'm happy to share on this. Um, I can just put it in the chat. Um, but some of the best research, I think, has come from some folks, many names that folks may know. Um, the Coral Project has done some really great work. Um, I've compiled a lot of this. Um, and there's also, you know, just the idea that, um, sorry, I'm <laughs> blanking for just a second. Um, the idea that, again, that civility itself, if we believe that to be a goal, and I think that that's certainly up for discussion, but that civility just is not, um, yeah, that, that we don't have that evidence there. So let me just throw that into the chat um, instead of trying to, to summarize all of this. <laughs> we can share that with participants. Um, David, I want to give you a chance to respond, particularly to this point about the relationship between civility and anonymity. You know, I want to, I want to get back first to go back to the, uh, the point about anonymity and identity. Um, I think it's important that we add another layer of identity to the identity as, that's known in real time to the co people communicating and identity that, that's verifiable or, or, or um, identifiable after the fact for accountability. Um, and I think that while it's very possible, like you're saying, that, that some, some bullying and some behaviors might be prevented by people being allowed to have less information about who they are in the conversation, but when people behave badly on the internet or if someone's you know, unleashing bots on a conversation or spamming or, or robocalling. I, I think one thing I'd love to see in the digital space is a forced um, traceable identity so that after the fact, if someone's behaved badly um, in, in the digital space, that you know, authorities can go back and trace and, and, and punish people who behave badly. Mike Cernovich maybe isn't punishable because of his position, but other people would be. Um, but in terms of the, uh, you know, you also, you also mentioned the idea of, you know, working in democratic countries versus non-democratic countries. And I have a lot of problem with the way we treat China, just as an example, that we allow our corporations to monetize their platforms and other products, you know, uh, the NBA, uh, uh, other, other products that are being allowed to do business in China. And yet we complain when they're abiding by the laws in the country. And I think that we, you know, if, if we allowed other countries to impose their laws on business being done in America, I don't think we'd be very happy with that. And I think it's, it's really a precarious position to put companies in to be the arbiters of how these citizens in other countries get treated by the government. So I, I think that there's, you know, to say that the platforms ought to behave the same all over the world and they should have the, they should, they should um, you know, uh, abide by the least common denominator. I agree that in China, it is certainly not safe for people to have conversations knowing that the Chinese government is allowed to do whatever they want to do with those conversations. But at the same time, by letting the platforms operate there, we're creating the problem that we're asking for-profit companies to figure out how to solve. And I think that's, uh, that's creating a problem in and of itself. It's an interesting point. And actually one of the themes that's come up consistently across this entire series around the tensions between uh, sort of global versus local policies um, around things like mis and, mis and disinformation and the problem with, you know, U.S., predominantly U.S. companies sort of exporting um, views and, and values and principles around things that are very different uh, in different geographies and different contexts. Um, Jillian, I know you've been a, a very vocal critique of some of these proposals around real name or user identity verification policies. In fact, I, I believe I read something about you referring to this phenomenon as the white man's gambit. Um, so I wanted to just give you an opportunity to explain what you mean by that and, and why you think this phenomenon occurs. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, I, you know, white man's gambit, I, I just finished watching the queen's gambit and it just popped into my head, but I mean, we could really just call it the privileged Westerners gambit if that's more comfortable for folks. Um, really, I mean, there's a few things here. So the white man's gambit, the idea is really just that um, the people who are doing, who are proposing these, these sort of limitations to anonymity are often privileged people in the United States and Europe who are not really thinking about all of the use cases. Um, and so I think it's really important to a couple points. One is, 
we're not just talking about China. And these companies put themselves in this position in the first place. Um, we didn't put them there. They promoted these values from the day that they launched, um, and they've slowly backslid on these ideas. And so, you know, Facebook chose to open offices all over the world. China is actually not even on the table. We can talk about Poland, which is my next door neighbor, um, which is currently, you know, people's lives are at risk there if they identify as LGBT. Well, I keep stumbling on that acronym. Um, so that's one thing to remember, that these companies started off by promoting free expression. They chose the position that they're in. Um, but on the idea of background verification, I just wanted to jump back to that for a second, because I I actually was very much in line with that idea in the past, too. And I think it has its place, but there's a couple issues with it. One is, who are we going to trust to hold on to that data? Um, because I don't think these companies can be trusted to do that. Um, I, I want to make the point that that, you know, these companies aren't, we're not, again, not China. These companies regularly hand over data to governments such as Turkey's, um, to, you know, India, to a bunch of other places that are very quickly um, backsliding when it comes to democratic norms and human rights. Um, and then the other thing is even, you know, in the United States, I'm not sure that I would have wanted um, any of these companies or the U.S. government to have access to my personal data in the last administration, maybe not even the current one. So I think it's really important to remember that um, the U.S., I mean, democracy is kind of the, almost the, it's becoming the outlier globally. Um, we, China may be the lowest common denominator, but the vast majority of the world right now has a bunch of, you know, risks when it comes to these ideas. David, I want to give you a chance to respond. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I think the, the white man's gamut, it's a humorous uh, 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 moniker for it. I view it more as kind of like the the current power structures gambit. Um, and I think that the, the last year or so has shown us that there's a lot of volatility around who's gonna be in charge of the government and the country in America, if not around the world um, in the coming years. I think the progressive movements, the uh, the rioting that happened over the last year, um, the success of those movements, although it seems like maybe they're retrenching, but um, I think that there's, there's a problem that I have with people saying, I don't trust government, therefore we can't let government govern us. Um, I think that we have to take, the, I mean, I should, we don't have to. Um, I, I prefer to take the tack of saying, I need government to be trustworthy to do these things. I need to do everything I can to ele help elect a government that we can trust. And then we need to put the power in their hands to protect us from them as well as from other forces. Um, and I, of course, I don't want the gov this government or any government to have my data. Um, but I do think there's certain enforcement abilities that governments have, which they've always had, um, and I think are reasonable for them to have, which we need to enable in the, in the digital realm, um, the way that they exist in the physical world. And I ha actually have some techn technological proposals of how to do that, but I think it's a hard problem. But you know, the, right now, I agree with you, there are, are elements in our government which I don't trust to do these things well. And you know, mission number one is to find a way to get a government in place that we can trust with this. But I think asking for-profit companies to do it is exactly the wrong thing to do, precisely because their mission is to make money for their investors. Telling Google they can't do business in China is one thing. Asking them to decide not to do business in China is you know, un unthinkable. They're gonna make a lot of money in China and they're not expected to have human, human values, apparently. And, and well, maybe, maybe you, might, you <laughs> might expect them to do, but, 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 but you know, the, the, way capital, the way unregulated capitalism works is that they don't have to. I, I'm a big fan of regulated capitalism. The Torah is actually a big business business document with a bunch, bunch of laws which describe how humans should do business with each other in humanistic ways. But right now, capitalism is not working that way. And I think it's problematic to put it in the hands of capitalists to decide how to do this. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's talk about capitalism uh, <laughs> and large corporations. Um, Jillian, you've just written a whole book <laughs> <laughs> on the subject. Uh, so I would imagine you have some strong views, but could, could you talk about the relationship between these companies' business models and how that undermines our rights, uh, including freedom of expression and, and how that relates to mis and dis disinformation on the platforms? Absolutely. And also yeah, feel free to respond. 
No, I mean, I'm finding myself, you know, I, I, David, I think we, we very much agree on principle. I think my concern is really just that, you know, we might be able to accomplish these things in the U S but then what about the other hundred and I, wow, lost count of how many countries we've got now. Um, yeah. I mean, the book that, the book that I wrote is, um, fr- uses Shoshana Zuboff's framework of surveillance capitalism. Um, she's got a very long book out there, but you can go and read a nice summary of it. There's some great ones. And really, this is just the idea that, um, these companies are sucking up our data for their profit. It. You know, these companies, as David said, are only accountable to their shareholders, despite the fact that many of them, and I will, I, I will note this for the audience, that Google and um, Facebook and a number of these other companies did commit to the Global Network Initiative um, more than a decade ago and committed to abiding by human rights frameworks. So, they, you know, they, they signed the papers um, and they've decided to not uphold those commitments. But nevertheless, um, what my book gets into is really the idea that within this framework of surveillance capitalism, of these companies profiting off our data and guiding our choices um, through that, that um, free expression cannot thrive. Um, it can't thrive when the, you know, the entire purpose of the companies is to make money. Um, and so there's a chapter called Profit Over People, which gets into this deeply. Um, but really, I mean, you know, we saw some news, sorry, I'm jumping a little bit, but we saw some news this week that um, Facebook's vice president of integrity, ironically enough, um, basically said, oh, bummer about what's happening in the Honduras, but we really only care about what's happening in the US and Europe. I'm paraphrasing, of course. Um, but I think that that's kind of the point that we've gotten to where these companies, uh, of course, they're, they're looking at China, they're looking at um, these big markets, Turkey, that's another big e-commerce market. Um, and what happens is that all of the other nations of the world fall by the wayside. And that's really what my book tries to get into is the ways in which these companies are um, kind of treating people around the world in an imbalanced way, um, censoring through, again, we can debate the term censorship, but I use it in a way that is um, based on authority and not government, which is, you know, it's an original definition. Um, the, the ways in which these companies effectively have more control over our speech in some ways than even our governments do. Yeah, thanks, Jillian. I think that's a really important point. Um, and also want to go back to something uh, we mentioned earlier about privacy, um, David, in a magazine article last year, you said um, you, you had an interesting remark uh, saying that the problem we have online is too much privacy. And in a post Cambridge Analytica world, you know, with a monstrous one data leak after another, <laughs> one data breach after another, um, at a time when we pretty much all absorb some of Shoshana Zuboff's teachings on surveillance capitalism or, you know, watch some popular films on the subject. Um, can you please explain how we have too much privacy? Well, I, I think that um, we can't expect what we have online to be protected, as you just pointed out, the massive breaches in Facebook and LinkedIn. And the truth is, every time I hear about a breach, I assume there are 100 times more breaches that are happening continuously that no one's talking about because they don't know about them. Because if you have a breach in a system, you never want anyone to know, so you can keep getting the data. So I, every time we hear about one, I assume that that's just a small part of what's actually going on. And so I think expecting the things we have in the digital realm to be private means that only the the, the people we least want to have them are going to have them. So um, I assume everything on my computer, everything on any digital device I have is known to the world and I behave accordingly. Um, But what we do by by trying to give the appearance of propriety is that we take the ability to oversee what's going on in digital realms away from the people who might actually benefit you and themselves, you know, or you and society by having it, you know, example is, uh, you know, kids interactions on the internet. Um, there is no good way for me to monitor and oversee my children's use of the internet, their interactions with other people on the internet and dangerous things happen. And there's all sorts of tools that have come out to try to um, improve that oversight. But just the fact that it's, it is, there's a decision to allow those things to be private prevents parents from having access to that kind of interaction in a way which is makes it really hard to parent. Um, and I think there are reasonable ways that people might want to, to, to see into what's going on, again, possibly after the fact. Um, so, you know, if something, is, something you know, untoward has happened on a platform to your child or to, to yourself and you want to, you know, investigate it, uh, the privacy mechanisms we have now, now in place prevent authorities from looking at them in, in a lot of cases without a subpoena, without a lot, of, uh, a lot of work. And yet the platforms and hackers can get that at them very freely. So I, I think that, that we, we have a strange way of looking at privacy where again, the, the people you least wanna see things 
have se seemingly nearly unfettered access to them and the people who, that might benefit you from seeing them can't see them. Yeah, and, and on a point you made earlier about private communications, um, I'd also just like to add a follow-up question about how you think about things like encryption um, in this context. Yeah, I think that the, one of the solutions to what I talked about where basically everything that I have online is viewable by, by the worst, you know, the worst possible sources is encryption all the time. And I think that it's something that is reasonable, you know, to have, uh, you know, the things that you consider private and personal to have them in a form where only the people that use explicitly permission to see them can see them. And more importantly, that whenever someone decrypts something, that there's an, an enforced audit trail which guarantees that the decryption event will lead to an audit entry so you can know who's seeing things. If that were the case, then I would feel much more comfortable putting things on my computer or you know, on digital devices that were private to me. And if I was afraid that let's say authorities were investigating me or, or someone was, was uh, breaking into my system, at least I can look at the audit logs to see when there were accesses to my information. But right now with, um, without encryption, both in terms of communication and, you know, and, and uh, encryption at rest, we really have no idea who's looking at our, our computer systems and our data at any given point in time. Jillian, what do you think of this? Um, what do you think of this idea of having too much privacy? Yeah, I mean, well, I have to say well, to David's last point, I actually really um, strongly agree with that. And I feel like I, I need to express that. Um, I, you know, I, I've traveled all over the world and I am terrified every time I carry a device, to be perfectly honest. I'm, I, for years, I had a journalist visa in my passport um, for Germany for my residence here. And it made it very tricky and very risky for me to enter certain countries. I just had to, you know, go in with no digital devices, which can be nice. Um, but yeah, to the idea of too much privacy, I mean, I think, I kind of want to flip that a little bit and, and talk about what companies keep private, because I think that that's the other piece of this puzzle, that these companies are completely opaque in so many of their practices, whether we're talking about uh, you know encryption, as David was just mentioning, um, or the ways in which they moderate content, the ways in which they apply their own rules and companies' rules. I mean, right now, um, I, I'm I want to get this right, so I'm just going to quickly look it up. But right now, most, the vast majority of social media platforms um, do not notify users when their data has been requested by their government. And so again, like if we're talking about the United States, we have judicial protections in place, although I, I still think that users should be notified. Um, but for a lot of these countries that I, that I work in, that I'm, that I'm looking at, um, you know, users have no idea if their government has requested something and Facebook has no qualms about handing it over to some of the most authoritarian governments in the world. If you look at their transparency report, whether again, Facebook, Google, Twitter, all of them, um, the vast majority of them do hand data over to, to Russia, to Turkey, to Saudi Arabia even. Um, maybe not China, but again, China is the outlier here. So I think that you know when we're thinking about too much privacy, we, I think we got to think about the companies too. But um, one of the, the good pieces of news there is that the European Union is looking at um, regulating this through the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act. Um, so there is a little bit of hope in that space. Yeah, thanks for bringing up regulation. Um, so <laughs> if, you know, these real name user verification policies are not one of our better solutions, um, maybe Jillian, I'll turn to you first. I mean, what do you think uh, some of the more promising solutions are in terms of combating this and disinformation specifically? I think it's a really complicated question. I'm still working it out, to be perfectly honest. Um, that was maybe the hardest part to write in my book, and I'm very glad that I finished it before the last six months of the Trump presidency, um, <laughs> just to be perfectly frank. But, um, you know, I think that when we talk about misinformation, it's, again, it's always, my brain always goes towards the edge case. Um, you know, so to give an example of this, vaccine misinformation. Um, I don't think vaccines are an edge case. I'm very pro-vaccine, but I also have a chronic illness that has a lot of misinformation around it in the medical community. And so my brain is trained to go, oh, I'm a little skeptical of what this doctor is going to say. I'm going to get a third, you know, second, third, fourth opinion. Um, and so I think that it is really important for people to be able to speak about these things, whether in private or in public. Again, the problem comes when that creates a cascade that results in, in people, um, you know, being 
hesitant about vaccines and things like that. So I think it's a really difficult problem, not necessarily an intractable one, but it's one that we need to solve, not just through um, techno solutionism, but also through looking at the ways in which we educate children. Um, I know I learned a lot of disinformation in school. I'm sure that people did wherever they're from. Um, the way that we educate, the way that we teach people about critical thinking. Um, and of course, when it comes to the internet, I think that you know fact checking and trust-based networks and things like that are also really important. But I am very skeptical of just this um, take down method that a lot of companies have relied on. And so I'm happy to see them moving towards things like, um, you know, Instagram's putting up the WHO or the CDC, wherever you happen to be based, um, link when the word vaccine pops up. It's a little blunt, but it's one good solution that doesn't limit people's expression. Uh, David, I'd love to give you a chance to weigh in here. Yeah, so um, early on in my advocacy, I was very much a uh, proponent and advocate for regulation and coming up with lots of really detailed proposals. I wrote, wrote a white paper on, on a technological proposal for um, regulating the internet more and, and uh, tracking data use more. Um, I, I've come to decide, to realize that that's, I was being kind of paternalistic and frankly using my money to give my, my opinions an outsized weight. Um, also my demographic, I'm like, you know, on the older side of, of, of uh, human life and uh, a lot of the younger people have more, in, more at stake with uh, what happens in the internet community and with, in the digital realm. So I've, I've kind of looked more towards a, a two-pronged approach to my advocacy. One is I think about education. Um, I think it's really important just to make as many people aware of as many of the, in a balanced way, the, the impact, not the, not the negatives of the internet or data, data monetization or data use, but just the, the impact of it. There's positives and negatives. You get a better, better sale price on the shoes you want. Um, you know, but at the same time, you give people the opportunity to, to monetize you and to manipulate you in ways that in many cases are against your best interests and against society's interests. So I think just, you know, I think social dilemma was a great, um, uh, a great example of this. A coded bias seems like a, a, a really good effort at that. I think there are, there are efforts now to just educate the masses and let people decide what they want to advocate for themselves. Um, and, and, you know, going back to the kind of the one person, one vote, let, you know, let money stop driving the decision making and let it be based on the masses, um, you know, goals and intentions. You know, that said, um, there's a lot of manipulation going on even in that process. And so I think there is a role government can play. And I think the best thing the government can do is simultaneously implement something like what I said, which is having data encrypted and have access to data. And when I'm talking about data, I mean, mostly human behavioral data that's being monetized um, to create artificial intelligence models to manipulate people, but all sorts of human behavioral data is all around the internet. And if it were encrypted and the use of it was audited, then, and let the, let the governments just collect the audit data. Don't make any decisions, wait a couple, maybe may, wait a year, wait two years, aggregate that data. And once you have a critical mass of data, then study it and figure out kind of in a big picture across industry, across different organizations, how is data being used? Is it being used in ways that are harming people? Is it be being used in ways which ought to be regulated? Um, and I think that if, if, you, if you got the government to have that information, they would be able to come up, come up with more intelligent, more informed regulations, as opposed to kind of either the knee-jerk reactions sometimes we're having now, or sometimes the politically or economically motivated reactions where you know, companies are willing to have regulations that don't really do anything to their, prop their profit margins and probably don't create much protection for the consumers either. So I think if we take that two-pronged approach, I think we'd have a chance of making an impact on the problem. Jillian, do you want to respond? No, no. I mean, I actually, I think that there's a lot there that I agree with. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Great. I'm, sorry, um, I'm, I'm trying to agree with you as much as I can, but it's really not working. <laughs> Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I think, David, I, I'd like to ask you a more personal question, which is, you know, given your background as a computer scientist, an expert in, in data science and, and with the quantitative rigor that you have, I'm, I'm curious about how you think that impacts the way you see these problems and also the solutions. And you've mentioned things like um, bots and more automated processes. So um, what, what is the role of this sort of quantitative uh, element here? Well, so actually a lot of it comes from my experience at Renaissance uh, doing quantitative trading um, and now seeing how uh, deep, deep learning and neural networks are being used so successfully to model behavior um, that there's so much information in 
just everyday data that we see, whether it's stock market data, you know, financial transactions or location data, uh, the way people behave. And the amazing thing is that uh, deep learning models, these neural networks that kind of create, you know, deep structure, hypothesize deep structure about data in nonlinear ways and figures out ways of modeling the behavior at the heart of the data set that it has, and then being able to predict that behavior on future data sets. Um, I think that's really proving itself to be powerful and dangerous. And you know, I, I, my, my day job is as a venture capital investor, and I look at startups that are doing this in every industry across the world, across, across uh, the, the, the economic community, and they're doing it well. And what that tells me is that if we don't get a handle on controlling how human behavioral data is accessed and used, look, it's great when companies can, can provide a good product that can help people with their services using the models. I'm not worried about that at all. I think it's great. I think throughout human history, we've seen whether it's the, the nuclear, nu nuclear energy or, or uh, medicine and biological uh, uh, science, that everything that we create that can help us, there's bad people out there who are looking to use it to do as much harm to us as they can. And I think the uh, internet age and the, the information age has made it much easier for individuals very, on a very small scale to create massive global harm. Um, and in my world, you know, this uh, phenomenon of Wall Street bets, uh, where these, uh, you know, these meme stocks were manipulated to the tune of billions of dollars of market movement by a group of uh, Reddit, uh, uh, Reddit activists who were manipulating hundreds of thousands of people to spend their savings on what I would call really bad stock trades, you know, that, that it shows that the people understand how to manipulate people where like one or a small group of people can have a really large impact on society. And they're doing it with data. They're doing it with, with these, uh, you know, psychologically motivated deep learning models trained on human behavioral data. And if we don't get a control over how that data is used in the future, we're gonna keep having repeats where more than just stock prices are gonna be manipulated, but you know, vaccination sites are gonna be targeted, um, other kind of health, health, um, you know, uh, health issues are gonna be targeted around the world and political processes, as we've already seen the last few years with Cambridge Analytica, but that's gonna be the norm. And really, I think that's a real threat to democracy. Uh, very interesting that you brought up Wall Street bets. I mean, I think if we expand the definition of misinformation and the scope of what we consider mis mis and disinformation online, we've seen manifestations in different contexts. And I think, you know, in some ways, <laughs> that's a problem of mis and disinformation in financial markets. Um, and this also relates to a point, Jillian, you brought up earlier around um, cryptocurrency and your experience in certain uh, geographies around that. Um, I was wondering if you both wanted to weigh in on what we're seeing happen with regard to cryptocurrencies and how this relates to the questions of anonymity and, and identity online. Um, maybe Jillian, we'll start with you. Um, this one's a real struggle for me. I just want to comment on David's last thing, and then I will come back to cryptocurrency. Um, I, you know, I really do agree with the concerns that you raise about the the power that individuals now have with a lot of these tools in their hands. But in the same vein of, you know, the Second Amendment, the way that we think about weapons, I mean, I, I'm not, don't get me wrong, I'm not pro-machine gun in any way, shape, or form, um, but the argument that, you know, citizens need to protect themselves from tyrannical government, I think also kind of applies in this circumstance. When we think about the ways in which the United States has used cyber attacks to take down countries they don't like, um, I think that, you know, there does need to be a balance. And so we do always have to think about it in that framework. Um, the U.S. has, you know, utilized cyber attacks to attack countries like Iran um, in ways that have caused serious damage for civilians. And I think that's important to note. Um, when it comes to cryptocurrency, I mean, again, you know, I'm, I'm a little, I'm probably a little out of sync with my own organization on this one. And so I'm, I'm careful here to state that this is my personal view. Um, I'm concerned about it. I mean, I, Berlin right now is absolutely flooded with Bitcoin money or whatever coin we're on these days. Um, I think that the NFT art market is another thing that's, you know, just absolutely bizarre. I'm trying to wrap my head around it. Um, but again, you know, when we're looking at the utilization of these technologies in other geographies, um, we're not not necessarily talking about this massive wealth creation. Again, we're talking about people's ability to utilize currency 
um, under restrictive governments that may not otherwise allow them to. And one of the key examples that I always come back to, um, to I'll just use Iran as another example here. The U.S. applies, uh, as people probably know, the U.S. applies really harsh sanctions to other countries, which are intended to manipulate or manipulate or um, adjust the behavior of government, but often have an incredibly deleterious effect on the citizens of those countries. And one of those ways is, of course, financially. And so um, cryptocurrency has enabled Iranians who are not able to access most of the tools that we use in our daily lives, basically creating a massive knowledge gap for an entire nation of people. Um, cryptocurrency has enabled people to do things that they wouldn't have otherwise been able to do because of the United States frankly, bullying of that country. I um, mean, it's not just Iran, it's a number of other places in the world. But I think I always come back to that example because it's actually you know, kind of going up against the United States, a giant, um, as opposed to say the Moroccan example where it's people kind of pushing back against their own government's restrictions on currency. But either way, I think that it's always just important to consider those use cases as well as of course, these kind of wild things that are happening in the United States and Europe. Yeah, I think one of the struggles we're seeing, even in this conversation, is this tension between, you know, anonymity and identity in different contexts. You know, financial transactions has come up a number of times. Cryptocurrency um, is certainly now even broader <laughs> than the notion of a financial transaction, as we're seeing. Uh, David, any views on this topic? Yeah, uh, I'm actually, uh, you know, embarrassed to say I totally missed the boat on crypto. I was very cynical and skeptical of it um, and, uh, you know, <laughs> cost my investors a lot of money, I guess. But um, and I'm still skeptical of its long term, because if you look at, at, at cryptocurrencies as, you know, on the one hand, um, Bitcoin, on the other hand, um, uh, Libra, and the third example would be China's uh, new digital yuan. And I think that those are three examples of problematic um, approaches to digital currencies, which I think all of which you know, magnify the flaws. Um, you know, Bitcoin. You know, American American financial system is you know just completely um, filled with regulations about know your customer, um, verified transactions, counterparties, and Bitcoin just does not allow it. You know, full stop. So um, I can't imagine the American government allowing it to be a big part of uh, American commerce, precisely because they have these regulations, not because they feel like it, but because they feel they need that um, oversight, and they wouldn't have it. Um, Libra is, is a terrifying thing. The idea of a, a for-profit company having the ability to put money in the pockets of its customers in a way which would give that platform absolute control over those people by virtue of the fact that a, a growing part of their, their, their savings would be denominated in a currency that they control. Um, thank God that was thwarted and I hope that they continue to be stymied in that. So the China is, is, is the worst case scenario, which is that they're going to replace a dollar, which people, you know, the, the, the currency that they have with, which people can put in their pockets, put in their mattresses, put it wherever they want and replace it with a currency which they can actually monitor every single transaction that everyone does for all time with, trip, with minimal work. Um, so I think th those are all examples that show, that highlight where cryptocurrency can't go. Um, and and my, my one final comment on it is that I think that monetary policy is one of the most important things that governments have in controlling their countries. Um, you know, you know, they monitor their borders, they have militaries, and they have monetary policy. And I think that governments around the world, if they saw a path to be losing that ability, I think that would rise to the level of, of a war. I think that they would be willing to take military actions to protect their ability to control monetary policy because it's such an important tool for, for, for you know, uh, for human health and services, for, for everything about controlling government, you need to be able to control a fiat currency. Um, and again, you might not trust the government to do that well, um, but I, that goes back to my comment that we need to get good government in there. But I think for all those reasons, I don't think that cryptocurrencies in the long run are gonna have the outsized dominance that some people are predicting. But look, I've been wrong. <laughs> I've been wrong for the last uh, two years. So uh, we'll, well, I'll keep an eye on it and, and you know, adjust my views if, if, uh, if evidence shows otherwise. Jillian, what do you make of that? 
Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the, the place where David and I seem to agree the most is the importance of good governance. Um, I, you know, where I'm coming to a lot of these questions is from a position of feeling that way, right? That good governance is the key here, but also noting that the vast majority of the world does not have good governance at the moment. And that that's why it's so important for us to consider these things if we believe in, and again, I'm I, the one thing I'm not is a nationalist, um, if we believe in a strong global economy, a strong global society, and knowledge equity throughout the world. I think that's where it's just so important to consider the rest of these nations and, and the other people's experiences in this. And so cryptocurrency right now feels, I guess, you know, my gut feeling is that it feels like a necessity in a lot of the societies in mean, Lebanon, you know, a country very close to my heart where we've seen just ridiculous inflation over the past year because of incredibly bad governance, almost anarchical, well, in the negative sense, governance. Um, and so yeah, I think that's fundamental agreement there. Thank you. Um, it's also really interesting to see how much this has mirrored the same conversation around the sort of pitfalls and promises of, you know, the internet more generally, where you have uh, the same technologies being leveraged in very different ways with very different outcomes. And as our Berkman colleague, uh, Evelyn Duke would say, you know, everything is a content moderation problem. And in some ways, <laughs> with digital currencies and things like the digital yuan, as you mentioned, David, I mean, I think that's becoming more, more apparent. Um, I, I did promise to leave time for some, uh, some audience questions. So I do want to turn to those now, since we only have about 10 minutes remaining. Um, this one's quite a bit of a pivot, uh, but the first one is for David. So since you publicly spoke out against uh, Robert Mercer and his support for former president Donald Trump's campaign, uh, and, you know, he's also implicated in financing Cambridge Analytica and some of the related social media campaigns, um, saying it was against your conscience to contribute to a firm furthering that political agenda. Um, since we are an ethics lab <laughs> and ND Tech is an ethics center, you know, from the perspective of, te of technology ethics, um, what do you advise technologists to do when they're working on a technology or for a company that is against their conscience? Yeah, that's a really hard question. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm in a position where I, you know, financially, I, I have a, a freedom that most people don't have. So uh, to say, tell people don't, you know, just, just quit uh, is really unfair. Um, I do think that um, I can speak for myself to say that I spent 20 years doing something that at the end of the day, I feel like was net worthless to society. And I have deep regrets about it. So I tell people, think about, you know, when, you, when you're in a job, think about doing it for the next 10 years and having the consequences that ha it has. And regardless of how much money you make, decide for yourself if you think that you'll feel good about having devoted your intellectual energies, your expertise to, uh, to, to doing that. Um, and I think the efforts to advocate um, as much as possible internally to companies to get them to be more accountable um, is, is an important step also. But um, you know, I didn't, I didn't quit my job because of uh, Cambridge Analytica. I got fired. Um, and, and frankly, I would have gone back um, if not for a few, a few uh, minor details. Um, but the, the, you know, the idea is, you know, I think that people ought to be transparent about what their goals are and their intentions are. If, um, if Google would just say, we want to be evil, um, I'd be okay with them. The problem is that they went this whole thing of don't be evil. And then they went and they, they went and were evil for a while. So I think that if companies would just be clear and transparent and people and executives and, and, and advocates and, and, and political donors would just be clear about what they're doing, I'd have no problem. I would have no problem with Bob Mercer saying what he said and supporting what he supported if he just would have come out and put his name behind it and, and put his political views and his goals and intentions behind it as well. Thank you. Um, Jillian, any views on tech worker activism uh, in yes. relation to these problems? <laughs> Yeah, no, I think it's a huge, huge component. And I agree with David that, you know, if these companies were just transparent, we wouldn't be in this mess. Um, when I started doing this work, talking, I mean, and I, I talk to these companies on a regular basis, I should note that's well documented in the book. It's not a secret. Uh, it's part of my job. But, you know, when I first started talking to Facebook circa 2010, they were incredibly open, forthcoming. In fact, they got in touch with me, a pretty mere blogger at the time, I must say, um, not to insult blogging, but they got in touch with me, reached out to me about something that I documented and said, hey, you know, we're here to help come to us anytime with concerns. And for a few years that genuinely worked. And then, you know, around 2014, we had the kind of trifecta of right-wing extremism, the Islamic State and Gamergate happen. All of this just changed. Um, and so over the past few years, as these companies have closed ranks, um, as people like Mark Zuckerberg have become more and more isolated, like Rapunzel in the tower, 
Um, I think what we've seen is the necessity for this worker activism. Um, and I think it pairs really well with the external movement as well. Um, we've got a really strong digital rights movement that encompasses a large um, number of topics. You know, some of us work for pretty well-funded organizations. There's also a lot smaller ones out there, but um, we do collaborate a lot and there's there's collaboration with the tech worker, worker activism as well. And just my last note there, um, in writing the book, one of the things that was very difficult for me in the beginning was trying to get people inside the companies to talk to me. Um, but over time, literally over the three year period and that I was doing this research, that shifted. Um, and suddenly I had content moderators pinging me through private channels. I had people reaching out to me uh, at conferences and I was able to talk to um, four of the most formative policymakers from these companies who were long out of them. Um, and so I think that things are shifting, hopefully for the better. Thank you. Um, another question is around the merging of the online and offline ecosystems um, and how we think about preserving public space um, when everything is digital. Um, and this actually relates to, to some of my own work as well around digital identity um, that sort of becomes embedded in all things digital and everything becomes digital. You know, what happens to sort of the notion of public life? Um, David, maybe I turn to you first on, on that particular question. Yeah, it's a sad question because um, I, I I will mourn the day when uh, the world moves to you know predominantly uh, digital interactions. Uh, there's a Isaac Asimov wrote a, a a series of science fiction books based around a society where people only communicated through holograms and were germaphobes and were afraid to be in a room with another person. And, and I think that would be just a calamity. Um, even even you know the, the the sadness of you know this COVID era where we're doing everything by Zoom and not interacting with people is just a really sad time for me. And I just hope that we eventually, and I, I do think we will, I think that human beings crave human contact. And I think that this, as much as di the digital realm is becoming so much a part of our lives, I do think that humanity will course correct and that we will find a way, especially as the digital realm becomes so toxic and so unpleasant. You know, look, my space was something until Facebook came along. And I think that, um, all these platforms that are popular with people will go to nothing when people leave them. So I, I just hope that it could take decades, it could take a while, but I do hope that we don't have to deal with a, uh, a, a world where the, the predominantly our interactions are in a digital realm. Yeah, um, Jillian, anything to add, particularly in the context of the pandemic and our more digital lives these days? Yeah, no, I mean, I moved to Berlin in 2014 in my, I guess, still early 30s. And, you know, this is a city where because of the, the city's unique history, um, the divided city, we, you know, you go to a nightclub here and there's no phones allowed or at least no cameras. They literally put a sticker over your camera. Um, ca everything was cash only when I first moved here. And all of that was fantastic. I met teenagers who didn't even own cell phones. Um, the pandemic has changed a lot of that. Now, almost everywhere you go, you can tap your card to pay. That really concerns me and you know the vast majority of Germans, it seems, based on the polls that I've read. Um, so I do see a shifting in that direction in some ways. But at the same time, um, as spring has finally sprung here, I've noticed you know people really not looking at their phones. Um, people are out on the streets. They're drinking their beers, which we can do here in public. Um, and you know when I I walk through the park. It's something that I observe now because I'm just curious and I don't see phones out. And so I do see that shift happening here already. And hopefully as we all get vaccinated and life returns to maybe not normal, but some semblance of it. Um, I agree. I think that there's going to be a natural shift um, away from screens as much as possible. At least I hope so. <laughs> I hope we can do this again next time uh, in person, maybe even in Berlin, if, uh, if David's up for it. <laughs> But I wanted to thank you both so much again for joining us today. I, this you, the pot panel could have moderated itself, really. Um, <laughs> but and I just want to put in a plug for our uh, next and final tech talk in our spring speaker series, which will be next week, uh, one week from today. We'll be joined by uh, Facebook Oversight Board member Julia Wono and Discord's Clint Smith uh, to talk about what smaller platforms can learn from larger ones face, about facing ethical challenges as they scale. Uh, and details and registration for that are at think.nd.edu, which is also where you'll be able to find the recording um, of this conversation. So um, Jillian, David, thank you once again so much. Um, it's really been a pleasure. Uh, we'd love to have you back. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it.
Same. Thank you, Elizabeth. You were fantastic moderator. <laughs> Take care. Have a good day.